Hi, it's my pleasure to welcome you in the third part of the lesson Gems from a non Galphant match. I'm Igor Smirnov and today we'll keep honing your chess skills by revealing some powerful techniques used by these great players in their World Championship battle. Here is the seventh game Galphant Anand. The position is balanced but still black experiences little problems due to his knight pinned over this diagonal. Anand found the most straightforward solution for this little trouble. He simply played queen b8, removing a queen from the pin. This move was pretty unexpected for most of the viewers and I'm pretty sure that most amateur players would never consider a move like that. At the same time, there is nothing groundbreaking for us here. In one of the previous games, we've already seen a similar situation. True, white can take an f6 and break up black's pawn structure on the king side. But as we already know, it's often not as much dangerous as it looks. So let me just emphasize the key factor. True, the black's pawns are disrupted, but this is a secondary factor. Well, the most important thing you should pay attention on is a piece activity. If your opponent doesn't have enough forces on the king side, he won't be able to attack you anyway. Thus, you shouldn't be afraid of that. And moreover, there are some positive changes in a black's position. He strengthened his center, he got a powerful dark squared bishop without a counterpart. Also, maybe someone in the future black will be able to operate over the g-file with his rook. Of course it's still unclear and white does have attacking chances, but the position is balanced with mutual chances so black can play it. Here's the next instructive position from the same game. At this point Gelfan could took on to e4 and win a pawn. Instead, he played queen to c2, which is a very profound idea indeed. Even most of commentators misunderstood the real reason behind this move. So let's try to clarify everything. The first question is why didn't he take onto e4, winning a pawn? Let's see what happens in this line. Here, black plays bishop b7, and in this position, it's better to go somewhere on the e2 to keep an eye on the black's weak pawn onto a6. Yes, black lost d5 pawn, but it turns out to be quite favorable for black. Now he has a long diagonal for his light scored bishop. His queen got an open d file to put pressure on the white's isolated pawn and all in all black's position became much more active. Still, this must be good for white. He's got an extra pawn well, and activity is approximately equal. At the same time, there are two other factors which are also important to take into consideration. The first reason is rather psychological. When your opponent is very inactive, when he is doomed for a passive defense, of course it's better for you to keep this unpleasant for your opponent's situation. He will feel uncomfortable, he'll be frustrated, and most likely he'll start making mistakes. This happens even with Anand. The second argument is rather practical. Right here, in this position, it's quite difficult for black to find any constructive plan. Even to find the next normal move. And if white takes into e4 and gives some fresh air for black, then the following moves for black will be not that much difficult. He'll play the bishop b7, he'll activate his forces, attack on the open files. So, all in all, it will be much easier for black to play in this position. And from this point of view, also it's better for white not to go onto this line. So far, we have discussed why white should not take onto e4. Now let's move on and think about the reason behind the white's move queen to c2. Uh, most of commentators said white wants to occupy the south rank by playing queen c7. Fair enough, but it's not the only and even not the main idea of the white's move queen c2. First of all, let's have a closer look at the black's pieces. 
Most of them are dozing on the last ranks. Black has only two pretty active pieces, which are knight onto e4 and queen onto d6. Yeah, the rook stands on a semi-open file, but the b2 pawn is already protected and there is no work for this rook anyway. Plus, it has to care about the bishop onto c8. Thus, black has only two active pieces, queen and knight. Therefore, if white can exchange these two pieces, the black's position will become completely hopeless. There will be no active warriors in a black's army. And that's what Galfon did with his following moves. After g5 he played queen to c7, trading off the queens, and on the next move after f6 white trades off the last active piece, knight onto e4, and here just take a look at this position. Black is completely unable to do anything, and his position is simply losing. It's a great plan found by Gelfand, and I suggest that you remember this idea. If most of opponent's pieces are inactive, a simple exchange of his few active pieces can give you a winning position. It's still the same game, but closer to the end. The white's position certainly must be winning, he is a piece up, at the same time black creates some counterplay and now white must be careful. Black's pawn is ready to go forward, but if white takes it, then after knight takes e3, black suddenly created a mating threat of knight g4, following with rook h1. Maybe black can also go knight f1 in some variations. This seems quite unpleasant for white, and white needs to cope with that somehow. What would you do here as white? Well, if you know the Galfon's move, then maybe it seems easy for you. But I bet it's not that easy to play like that in your own games. And that's why I recommend that you remember this practical idea. When you encounter problems, an opponent's counterplay, first of all, check if you can realize your plan quicker. Very often you can overcome opponent's plan by an insistent realization of your own attack. And very often it works. For instance, in this position, White simply played rook c7 and completely ignored the black's idea. Instead, he played rook to c7 check and then knight e5. You see, you solve a problem of defense very easily, you don't care about it at all. You simply focus on your own attack. And after e2 and knight takes e6, you're not resigned because if black creates a new queen or plays rook h1 first and even creates a new queen with check, then after king h2 still Black is defenseless because his king is in a mating net. On the next move, no matter what black do, white will go knight g6 check and then rook to g7 mate. Here is the next position I'd like to talk about. Well, there is nothing really interesting here, it is still a book position. Uh, there is only one note I'd like to make here. Uh, well, observing commentaries for this game, I've noticed that some commentators try to find a certain profound idea behind the following announced move knight e to c3. But of course, there is no idea here. The only real reason of this move is just to uh, go aside from Galfon's preparation. And that's it. Of course, an idea of making a lot of moves with a single knight from g1 to c3 such an idea cannot be great and Anant understand it perfectly. As I said, it's just an attempt to break Galfon's preparation and that's it. Just, I mean, you shouldn't completely believe to uh, commentators as unfortunately sometimes they can mislead you. Anyway, knight c3 was played and Galfon answered knight h5. What do you think about this move? Well, if we put Galfond aside for a moment, then knight h5 looks like an amateur move, like move of an amateur player who doesn't know chess basics. In an opening we need to deploy all forces first, and only after that we may start making some maneuvers. Of course Galfond is aware of that, I'm not really sure why he played knight h5. Maybe he wanted to break Anand's preparation, maybe he tried to confuse Anand who lost their previous game, but in any case knight h5 is wrong. At the same time knight h5 move wasn't criticized by commentators, I guess just because 
this move was played in a World Championship match. So, just once again, you shouldn't completely rely on commentators, as sometimes they can mislead you and sometimes they can not understand the situation perfectly. By the way, computer programs give quite good evaluation for a knight h5 move. Uh, really, it doesn't lose anything, it doesn't worsen black's position, but at the same time it's just uncalled for and strategically it's wrong, and that's what computers can't understand. So, in addition to commentators, I suggest that you don't completely rely to computer suggestions, as it shows you some variations and some evaluations, but it doesn't explain them to you, and that's the problem. Later in the game this position appeared, and here Anand played king d1, removing a king from a potential check queen h4. Uh, that's a good idea, the position is rather closed, uh, while white has a space advantage on the queen side, thanks to his pawn on d5, and that's why the white's king will feel uncomfortable on the queen side even without castling. At the same time, more natural move bishop e2 was also possible and it could lead to an interesting variation. Let's say black plays queen h4 check, king to d1, and here at first sight it looks like black is winning after the move knight to g3. However, white has a very interesting counter blow. He can play queen to e1, making a counter pin. So previously black used the pin on the white's h pawn, while well, right now White is making a counter pin on the black's queen, and here black can't save his knight and therefore he's losing. In the game Anand played king d1 simply. Now black experiences some problems, mainly because of his misplaced knight onto h5, and since both of the pieces are under an attack he has to exchange one of them, so bishop b1 was played, rook takes. Still, the black's position is quite unpleasant. Right now, he has to drive his knight backward, and after that, his attack is over, while white has a bishop against knight and a space advantage. In attempt to continue his attack by all means, Galfond played queen to f6, which doesn't work, because here white can take on the h5, and after queen takes, king, king to c2, and queen takes h1. Black won the exchange, but after queen to f2 on the next move, the black's queen is captured. On the next move, white will attack it somehow by playing something like bishop h3, and here Gelfand resigned. It seems like a sudden oversight, but in fact it's not. In this position, black faced difficulties and he didn't want to go backward and to admit that his attack failed. Therefore, the whole concept of black was wrong. The whole concept of knight h5 idea, approved by computer programs and commentators, at the end bring black an annoying and quick loss. Here's the next game, Gelf and Anand. And here Anand played bishop takes a3. After queen takes a3, as Anand said later on, uh, he knew an idea of bishop takes f3 following with e5 move. Uh, however, before playing e5, Anand decided to check variations, and here he discovered that e5 is too dangerous for black because after bishop f5, white puts too strong pressure on the black's position, and probably that's already bad for black. So, what lesson can we conclude out of this little part of the game? Nowadays, with an overabundance of all those just databases, programs, books, encyclopedias, and so on, we often make standard moves unthinkingly. Of course, it's not very good and sometimes can lead to bad consequences. After all, chess should develop our thinking skills, right? Thus, even if you are familiar with typical plans and maneuvers in a certain position, you still should try to think by yourself and check variations carefully. Well, maybe this looks very simple and obvious for you, but hey, Anand made this mistake by playing bishop takes f3. 
if an ant makes such mistakes, then we should be careful for sure. Several moves later this position appeared, and here Galfond used an interesting tactics. He played c5. This is not a sacrifice, because after an exchange, white is going to use a discovered attack on the black's queen. Really, after rook takes c5, white plays bishop h7 check, and after a king takes, white can grab an opponent's queen. Then the line continues, rook takes c1 and rook d1. Ok, now it's the end of the forcing line and we need to evaluate this position. Uh, from the material standpoint, black has rook knight and a pawn against a queen, which is approximately equal. At the same time, a queen is a very strong piece in an open position, and that's why here white will be playing for a win. In such a situation, when you're struggling with opponent's queen, it's very important to have strong squares, like the d5 square into this position. When you have such strong squares, usually you can create a fortress very easily. For example, in this position, in the future, after an exchange of the rooks, uh, black can place one of his rooks, well, the remaining one, on the d5, put the pawn on the a5, and it will be a fortress. Another variation, black can put his knight on the d5, and then bring his rook onto c7. And also everything will be protected in the black's camp. Thus, when you have a strong square, usually you can create a fortress without serious problems. That's what Anand did in this game, and later on they agreed to a draw. Let's pause the lesson here. I hope you enjoyed the video and learned some useful lessons. Feel free to share this lesson with your chess playing friends. Thanks for watching, and talk to you next time. Goodbye!